Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the first talk in the Humanities Festival on this Saturday, rainy Saturday. Um, before we start, may I invite you to come a little bit closer because we're intending to have really a conversation here. Uh, we would like to spend a bigger part of this one hour that we have uh, in conversation with our guest. So it will be really uh, good if you come closer, if you feel comfortable with that. Um, welcome to Leon Budstein. Um, a musician, an educator, and a civil society activist, if I might define it like that. Leon Botstein is a um, cosmopolitan by heart, I would say. Born in Zurich, living in the United States, working everywhere in the world, more and more uh, also here in this country. So the way he feels home and everywhere in, uh, in many places <laughs> in the world, he feels home, I think, in different professional fields, in the fields of art, in the field of education, and in the field of civil society engagement through philanthropy. Art. He has been music director and principal conductor of the American Symphony Orchestra, conductor laureate of the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. I'm sure I will miss many things that he has done, but just to give you an idea of the many, many achievements that he has. He's the founder and co-artistic director of the Bart Music Festival, founder of the orchestra now, um, founder of the festival Sight and Sound, which he also leads, um, and since 2018, since last year, director of the Grafenegg campus and the Grafenegg Academy here in Austria. Education, <laughs> he has been the youngest actually ever college president in the US history with 23 at that time, then became a president of Bard College, which he is still today. And he's also the chairman of the board of the Central European University, uh, a university which also has more and more ties to Austria. In civil society and philanthropy, he is member of the board of the Open Society Institute New York, one of the larger Ameri American foundations active also in Central and Eastern Europe uh, and who have left a uh, mark on the region, I would say, in the last 30 years. A public intellectual, an important voice. Welcome, Leon Botstein. Thank you. My first question to you would be, how do you conceptually reconcile these three fields of your activities, education, arts, and philanthropy? Uh, so the question, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, uh, you know, when you read someone's, describe someone's life or work, uh, we cut it into pieces, but from my own point of view, um, it all sort of fits together. So if you're an artist, uh, you have to ask the question, in my case, I'm a musician, why do people listen? Why do people play? Um, and what's the, what's the significance of it? So that leads you naturally to education. And in the American system, which is a, not a great one, the non-commercial arts, which is the ones that I'm in, uh, that require patronage, that don't make money. Uh, those commercial arts uh, require philanthropy. So you have to talk people into funding what you do. Uh, and the people you have to talk into doing that are not, um, are not distributing tax-based money. They're not distributing public money, only very indirectly because you get a tax benefit. But so uh, these are sort of natural. And the other thing is that in the institution that I am involved in, the arts are a major component. So in the American university system, the arts are integrated into the university. So the finest public conservatory of music in America is in Indiana University, which is a public institution and it's part of the university. 
So in a way, these things all sort of fit together. Let's start then chronologically. Um, what made you at 23 become a president of a college? What was the drive? What was the ambition then? Oh, it was a complete accident. So if you're a musician in the United States uh, and you want to make a career um, like an actor or a dancer, you have to have a day job. You know, if you're a writer, you have to do something. So I had friends who were waiters, right? And uh, people had some kind of clerical job. Uh, and uh, in order to earn a living when you're very young. And uh, uh, by a series of accidents, which is, uh, life is, when you go through life, one of the problems I would think metaphorically of the way we now use our handies is that we never look up anymore. We don't look around. People walk across the street looking or talking, right? And um, they don't see another person next to them, and they don't look at the environment. So um, careers are sort of like that. Um, you have a goal, but you should always look around. And the looking around ended my, it, I got into becoming a college president because a very um, smart um, and dynamic and very risk-taking man, John Kemeny, the mathematician, Hungarian mathematician, who was president of Dartmouth College, uh, recruited me into this enterprise and took a risk uh, on me as a very young age. So that was my, I never expected to do it. I never thought about doing it. I had no preparation to do it. Um, so it was a kind of desperate accident, uh, which I, I um, somehow but became then, a habit. Then you stuck to it, so to say, and became, uh, you built many institutions and reformed many institutions in education, in arts, in your life. So what is the drive of building institutions? What is the purpose of this tremendous effort? Well, so uh, the drive is very simply put. Um, I was, a, I came to America as a child from, uh, my parents were stateless. Uh, they came from Eastern Europe. They were in Switzerland as uh, temporary visitors for 20 years on six months visas, and they were supervised by the Fremdenpolizei. And uh, so, and America was closed. They applied for an American visa in 1935, and the visa came through in 1949, the end of 49, uh, for a Polish quota Jew to be alive enough to pick up a visa was 10%. They were very lucky because they were caught as physicians in Switzerland at the University of Zurich in the medical school. So when we came to the United States, um, the thing that I learned from my aunt, who was a righteous Gentile, a Polish Catholic, who rescued children from the ghetto in Warsaw, and had an uncle who, or two uncles who died in the ghetto in Warsaw. And um, what I learned from her is that if you have the opportunity to do the right thing, it's your obligation to do it. And so when I got a platform of a small university, the first question I asked is, what needs doing that isn't being done? And to try to do it. And in my case, it was the role of the arts in American education and in American culture. The second was, in our American circumstance, uh, the most catastrophic moment in education is the high school, is the American adolescent, the middle school and the high school. People always talk about elementary education as being significant, and that is true. But it is the secondary system. When puberty hits the American, the ability to acquire education is catastrophically disadvantaged. And um, it has gotten worse, not better. So, uh, so 
trying to do something to improve the secondary education, especially in the cities of the United States. So we now run seven public um, combinations of high school and college that give to inner city young people in Baltimore, Newark, New York, Cleveland, Washington, D.C., and New Orleans a free, free, no tuition, free access to a two-year college degree. We also have the largest prison education. We have 300 prisoners who are earning degrees, bachelor degrees, in prison. These are people who have been sentenced, men and women, to long sentences. They are been convicted of serious crimes. And uh, so the improvement of education was the second thing. The third thing is the American University is, was and remains highly provincial in the sense that its relationships abroad um, are, or its connections abroad are not very well thought out. So we have programs in Vietnam, in Kyrgyzstan, on the West Bank, and uh, in Russia, and also in China. And uh, these are not money-making, they're not filiales, they're not sort of McDonald's, you know, a franchise in another country. Um, so I think those are the three, the role of the arts um, in the university and in culture, the improvement of education, and um, the um, creating relationships beyond the border of America that are not um, simply uh, expansion of an American company in a way, the way NYU or Cornell have set up, or in China now, many universities have, have branches. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We want to do something different, so we have partnerships with Al-Quds University, with the American University in Central Asia, the new Fulbright University in Vietnam, which is a Vietnamese and American institution, they're dual degree programs, they're shared programs, where the students get two degrees, one from us, an American degree, and the degree from their home country. So how do you define the social function of art, leading from the role of building artistic institutions? In your opinion, what is the social function the, of the art, social there function. is one? So the social, for me, uh, the social function of the artist is rooted in its absence of utility, that it is useless. That's its most important function. That it has no purpose other than either spiritual or in the fabric of relationships. Um, Yes, paintings can be bought and sold, installations can be bought and sold. In the visual arts, there's more of a potential commodity. Uh, but in the performing arts, in theater, dance, music, as a live performance, even now for in, in my end of music, which is so-called classical music, um, even streaming, you don't make money from recording anymore. That, that's all gone. It's not a profitable enterprise. So, music in particular is useless. It doesn't have a real utility. It can be harnessed, and propaganda can be harnessed even in, um, in interrogations, the use of music in interrogation in a kind of uh, nasty way, which there are some instances of. But, um, so the social function uh, of art is, um, is different from another kind of human form of life. Uh, so uh, the first husband of Hannah Arendt was a philosopher named Günther Anders. And his initial work, his hab habilitation, was on the philosophy of music. And he gave that up because he got into conflict with Adorno. And Adorno successfully convinced Paul Tillich not to accept the habilitation, and he shifted. He left Frankfurt, went to Berlin. And after he died, his um, Habilschrift was published. And in it, it impressed me, it just came out a couple of years ago, and it impressed me no end because his theory of listening, why should people listen to music, the social function, is that in the modern world, it creates an alternative reality 
he had an idea similar to the Harry Potter films, you know, where there's the people like, the normal people like you and me, and then there are those special people who create, which we can't see, an alternative reality in which they are able to live a free identity and a spiritually rewarding identity that is entirely independent but contingent on their daily life. So the life of an ordinary person that is seemingly routine, um, where the search for meaning is very difficult, the act of listening uh, becomes, um, and the act of making music even more. I, I'm very interested in the encouragement of the act of making of art, not us as passive listeners to others. Um, so that the, uh, this, the, what art, the making of art, um, gives a, the, the, the citizen, your fellow citizen, an opportunity to create meaning, not an escape, not an escape, not a retreat, but meaning which is redeeming. So I've always been interested in the function of music in the concentration camps during the Second World War. Um, my grandfather, who was in ghetto and camp, who survived, was a music lover. And um, he remembers the only time he ever cried in a horrific situation was when a fellow inmate began to sing. And um, so I think the social function of art is to give each individual an access to construction of meaning in a world in which our own irrelevance seems so overwhelming, both by the numbers of who we are and our inadequacy through the political means, take the climate change issue, right? So climate change needs to happen, but it can't happen if we don't all participate. It's not gonna happen by tyranny, it's not gonna happen from above. So, but if we seem powerless, so, uh, art is a reminder of the sacred nature of every individual because it's the work of the imagination that is not, not predictable, totally unpredictable. Um, so, performance particularly and it never gets repeated. And then it has a continuing function in the memory. So it's a kind of alternative reality that you can give the average person to create something not average for themselves in their experience. Um, the art that interests me is not wildly manipulative. So the distinction between a bad film and a great film is that the great film allows you to put it together. I am particularly fond of opera because opera is not reproducible by technology. The HD film is not opera, that's a singing movie. Because opera has simultaneity. Six people sing, saying different things. Um, in the first act of Fidelio, for example. So you as the listener can put your own opera together. If you have a cameraman or camera woman, the opera is dead. I, I've never sat through a film of an opera because actually I can't then put the opera together unless it's a frontal you know, picture of the stage, a static picture of the stage. And um, so the, the um, and music in particular has always thrived in closed societies under dictatorship. So let's say here in Vienna, under Metternich. Music flourished as a coded language of expression. It was Grillparzer um, once said to Beethoven that he envied him being a composer because the censors had no idea what he was doing. How can you open a symphony and say no? Now, the Soviets found a way to do that. 
and the Nazis found a way to do that, but their, their attitude to style and music was bizarre. It, it, it had, it had a, the anti-modern stuff, it was the Entarte der Kunst, it was, it was hard to defend, but a novel, a, a theater piece, seems to have overt political content. I'm not, I don't think the social function of art is that it's subject matter. In fact, that strikes me often as hypocritical, especially in the visual arts. Um, and I share the suspicion that Jean-Jacques Rousseau had that if I go to the theater and I watch suffering on stage and I have compassion for that suffering, I felt I've done something good. You have done nothing good at all. That I've weeped wept, excuse me, wept for the suffering of some innocent on stage doesn't, I actually have expended my moral energy uselessly. And that critique is right in my view. So the social, that the art depicts suffering or cruelty. Now there are exceptions. Uh, Picasso Guernica is an exception. Um, uh, but its exception is because its formal attributes of art and it, the, the greatness of the, exceeds the, the, the story that it tells. So the, the, this art to be an expression of freedom or subversive to domination, the subject matter doesn't have to be overtly about that domination or that suffering. Um, that's the mystery that people can never figure out uh, in the music of Shostakovich, which is on the one hand official, you know, glorifying the state, and yet has something subversive in it, which is not quite clear. Um, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Galina Usvotskaya, the, the greatest woman composer of the Soviet period. And that music too is, has this double edge to it. Um, so uh, the, um, the uh, social function is particularly important where there's tremendous control on public gatherings. One of the reasons choral singing, let's say, in the 1820s grew is because the state permitted a Menegesangverein or a, um, uh, any kind of choral society. So in the counter-revolution of 1848, you'll see a lot of the people who were executed by the state were organizers of choral societies. They later in the 19th century became nationalistic, that's their other political function. But so um, music in particular has, communicates meaning, but the meaning is not, is not subject to confirmation. You and I can go to a concert and we're in public, and our response to what we hear is not equal. I don't know why you're responding any more than you know why I'm responding, why I would cry or why I would be moved. And therefore, a police observation of your reaction is hard to control. If I go to a theater and I see an example of tyrannicide, a tyrant being killed, and I cheer, it's more obvious. So the one-to-one the -one correspondence, especially in Franz Schubert, um, who has had many friends involved in, uh, in politically suspect activities, uh, there is a coded language, some coded language of resistance. And um, so that is, um, for me, the function of music is particularly uh, powerful in closed or highly controlled, uh, politically controlled environments. You said um, compassion with the poor on stage is a waste of time, right? With the suffering, but still, don't you think that an important function of art is to allow us to step in the shoes of the other? And particularly in, let's say, divided societies, which American society at the moment I think is extremely divided one, or in a situation of political conflict, there is this extra um, function of art to allow us to imagine the other, to allow us to imagine the other side and in this way promote reconciliation. So in the American context, I, I, I don't know enough about the European 
In the American context, it's a very good question. Um, this is complicated because on the one hand, you have a political resistance to what's considered cultural appropriation. Can a white artist represent the suffering of the black community? What Whether is your answer slavery? to this question? I'm very curious. Well, yeah, there's a very famous case of the painting of Emmett Till, a victim of lynching. Um, and there are people who believe that only Jews can make art based on the Holocaust or Roma, that the, only the victim has access. So there is a self-styled progressive view of a reductive cultural ownership, which makes the em imagining of the other very difficult. Um, uh, how is it that uh, gender, for example, sexual preference, is it possible for a novelist uh, to write about something that the reader thinks that individual is not authentically related to? I happen to think that's wrong-headed because I believe that the arts are a way of communicating the strange, the unfamiliar, and the different, and to communicate, um, to undermine fixed beliefs. So take, for example, the United States is in the grip of um, the deepest threat to its democracy and social fabric in my lifetime, unimaginable. And um, among the things that it has done, the Trump administration has done, is to increase this polarization against immigrants. Good example. There is no doubt that the artistic representation, whether it's film or whether it is um, in print or whether it is musical, uh, the representation of the human plight of refugees, immigrants, or the poor um, does seep in uh, and is, can be a common ground, also the public function of the arts. So um, uh, you find a figure like Bruce Springsteen, right? So his politics are clearly liberal, um, whatever that means. They're, but his popularity cuts across class, it includes working class, it includes people whose political allegiances are pro-Trump from, let's say, the Rust Belt states of the United States. So there is a common ground um, and uh, that can allow you to imagine, you know, this is not politically now fashionable but the most important book in the 19th century to put forward the crime of slavery was Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was translated into Russian in the 1850s, was banned by the state, went through innumerable editions, and was wildly popular and was instrumental in pushing Alexander II to accelerate the abolition of serfdom. Um, I bought in a Viennese antiquarian bookshop a long time ago a group of songs based on Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in the 1870s. Now, from a contemporary point of view about identity politics, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe would never have been published. Um, that doesn't mean that the novel is not without its difficulties, absolutely. In the very famous um, film called The Jazz Singer, which is one of the first sound films made it is, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it, but it is a great classic film. 
and the actor is Al Jolson. And the story involves a Jew whose father is a chazan, a cantor. And he becomes a pop singer. And his father is deeply upset. And his mother attempts to convince him to return home and to follow in the profession of his father and grandfather to be a synagogal cantor. And it comes to a crisis on the eve of Yom Kippur, of the Day of Atonement. The father is dying, and his wish is to hear his son sing the service of Kol Nidre Night. And um, she begs him to do it, and he is preparing to sing in blackface. And in the film, as he's putting the makeup on, he sees in the mirror the image of his father, the orthodox um, cantor. In the 1920s, the pogroms in Russia and the emigration to the United States created an alliance between Jewish organizations and black organizations. It's crucial to the development of the NAACP. And here, what today is unacceptable, in that context, it was a sense of commonality because before the civil rights movement, anti-Semitism in the United States was a significant issue. So there was a solidarity of exclusion. So the putting on of the identity of a black singer brought him closer to his own identity in relation to his father. Now that's an interpretation today which wouldn't, as Monsieur Trudeau has discovered, it's not possible. <laughs> I'm not advocating, I want to make myself clear, but I'm showing that the arts have to and continue to find um, the representation. So George Eliot, uh, the novel Daniel Deronda, right? Now, it's a, leave this thought the novel would be better if she had left the character of Daniel Deronda out. I don't know how such a literary critic comes to a conclusion like that. It's like taking Pierre Bezukhov out of War and Peace. I don't know how you do that, but you know, I'm not a literary critic. But <clears throat> I actually was fascinated as a reader by George Eliot, an English woman's ability to imagine the situation of an adoptive man who discovers his Jewish identity and how he deals with it. So that's what artists can do. And, um, you know, uh, generations of German readers developed notions about the Native American Indian through Karl May, who never left Germany. I don't think he ever saw a real Native American. Uh, but it, the whole image of what that was about. Um, so I actually, um, I'm in favor of the use of the arts to imagine not only who you aren't, but by imagining someone who you're not, get a more differentiated idea who you are. I feel very, very, I'm always amazed how reductive, especially in the xenophobia against migrants, how reductive our definition of ourselves. Um, the only good thing about the chaos of Israeli politics is the recognition that the epithet or description Jew is meaningless. Because there are many, many Jews who don't think I'm Jewish, which I clearly am. But you know, here I'm saying, so what does it mean to be an Austrian? What does it mean to be German? Uh, what does it mean to be English, Brexit? Um, so these are inventions, myths, that have the claim of history that the arts can puncture. Brilliant. Uh, at this point, I would like to open uh, for your questions. So please, whoever would like to ask a question, raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. And if you could speak very, this is acoustic here is like a bathtub. So I, I, I just 
speak very slowly so I, we can understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Please don't be bashful. There's a reason you came. <laughs> but maybe, well, the first. Uh, Ask anything you want. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, don't you think it's quite controversial that in modern world, like the great stars we all know from America and who are traveling to countries to spread their music are so stressed out. Isn't it isolating their freedom to create music? So I don't quite am sure I understood you. What, what limits the freedom to make music? Um, that they um, should hold on to rules or that they're traveling to countries and they're should spread their music, like to uh, travel and to, yeah. Uh, so if, if I understood, the, uh, I, tell me if I'm wrong, is it that you're concerned that the, that the, the process of distribution and commercial, yes, the commercial monopoly? Yes. Uh, yeah. So. I, I, I think you, you are on to something. I am not a fan of commercialized music, which I think actually um, is um, I, karaoke, for example, uh, or imitation of styles, um, or uh, very fashionable, popular um, arts to turn the listener into a consumer of a standardized product that has emotional, seems to have emotional significance. You see it in teenagers who get a da to hit, take a hit song, a Justin Bieber, you know. I mean, it, that, is a, that is a problem, but the way to counteract that problem, in my view, is to greatly democratize every person's individual to make music of their own um, or, to, or, to, or with the computer even, uh, to make visual art or video art uh, and to make music that they invent, even though it may be influenced by, but the moment you begin to imitate, you discover how you deviate, you, you know what I mean? Um, so the, the, um, the resistance to um, kind of passive use of music, um, which has been done by political parties, and you know, there's a long history of it. Um, there is a way to, to push against it, but it is mostly by encouraging individuals, and with modern technology, it's gotten a little easier, to make their own music. I've always objected to the way we teach music. So a child is taught music, how to read music, right? I think that is secondary to teaching a child how to improvise, how to make sound before looking at its notation. Um, so I think there's a limit um, but I don't deny it's a problem. Uh, I don't. Now, from is the entire uh, domination from the American side? I don't think so. But it's it's um, it is a problem. Uh, uh, the enter the commercial entertainment industry. Um, uh, its dominance, its influence, its near monopoly on. Um, in the discussion last night, for example, on social media, you know, Amazon and Netflix and these, these, they, they, one gets concerned about what, what that monopoly is about or that domination is about. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. And my question is, you mentioned that the role of arts, one of the role of arts is to undermine the fixed beliefs. And uh, my question is, what are the moral and ethical 
borders of artistic uh, representation. What I mean, especially if we are talking about the contemporary art, where the set of tools, tools uh, artists can use has increased dramatically. And where do, do we define what, is, what, what can be done and what cannot be done? If now we say that the role of arts is to undermine the beliefs, where are the borders? That's my question. The question is where are the boundaries? Yeah, where are the boundary? Where, what is allowed and what is not allowed? Uh, That's my question. I'm not sure anything is not allowed in the arts. I mean, I don't think, the interesting thing about the arts is that um, there is no rule enforcing. You, you, you follow me? Um, so in, in the only, the limitation uh, is specific to, um, especially with the democratization of distribution, let's say, on the, on, on over, over computers. Um, so uh, there is a kind of, um, it's an artist that doesn't gain an audience or a following, right, can consider their art in some sense um, to have failed, but it hasn't been disallowed. Uh, um, if I understand correctly, I don't think there there are any any rules. Um, so, if you shock an audience, or the audience walks out, I mean, there was a time. I have nostalgia for the time where people got angry about what they listened to. Nobody cares anymore, so you know, so they just don't show up. Um, in, in, in visual arts, um, the control is probably through the distribution network, whose music gets played, whose theater gets done. Um, and the other controlling mechanism has to do with conceits in each art form about the tradition of art making. So there is an internal dialogue um, of artists to artists about, um, so in music, which is what I know best, in the late 20th century up to now, there has been a real reaction against modernism. So you take Schoenberg and Berg and Webern, and then the modernist, the Darmstadt school, so people like Stockhausen, and Boulez, and sort of, and then in the 70s, 80s, young composers looked at the popular music around them and saw they had a huge audience. And uh, everything from rock and roll to movie music. Uh, and it also had a political significance. And they decided, why are we, we need to grab the audience. We need to immediately get some Response. So you have a generation of, of composers that rethought how they should write music. And there was a debate within them among composers. Uh, the same as when Jeff Koons, you know, appeared on the art scene. There were a lot of older abstract expressionist painters who thought he was a fraud, right? And were angry about it. So there is some control mechanism from within the um, training of artists um, about formal expectations of what constitutes good art or good poetry. And those, are, those um, generations have found a way to resist that. Um, the only case where, where your question is absolutely germane is where the state has a vested interest in, in what kind of art. So, um, and the most classic cases are um, Stalin and Hitler. And that is absolutely that, that's a serious issue. So um, a composer, for example, a non-Jewish anti-Nazi composer, Karl Amadeus Hartmann, really um, 
was in internal exile. He wrote music, but it was neither performed nor published. It came out after the war, all of the Hartmann that we hear, much of it was composed during the war, not all of it. Um, so where the state is concerned, yes, there's a tremendous arm of control uh, where the state has a monopoly. Uh, and it's interesting to look at what's happening in China uh, because the state has a tremendous role in the kind of music or art that's made. They have a vested interest in that. And there the artist quickly can find herself or himself in the position of being a dissenter. So uh, there are certain circumstances where the arts are the last bastion of free expression. Yes, there is there a question. Thank you. Um, I actually have a two-part question. Uh, the first part is whether you think, like I perceive, that there's a huge difference between American government or generally American support of the arts as compared to the support of the arts in other countries, Europe, Asia, and so forth. Um, and A, how do you account for that? There may be many reasons. Um, and two, how did you deal with um, your developing institutions and trying to uh, counter that resistance maybe or whatever in America in the work that you've done? So if I understood the question, the, um, so the American system is based on private philanthropy. The state has essentially no role. Um, even the theaters. Uh, so yeah, the state had a minor role, but important role in, in the development of the Lincoln Center, performing art. Um, it didn't have any role in the building of Carnegie Hall. Um, the Metropolitan Museum has city subsidy, but it's a private institution, essentially. And, um, or the Whitney Museum, or... Uh, the American system has the misfortune of being caught in a set of values which deems excellence as parallel to profitability. We have come to a point in the United States where the rich think themselves better because they're rich. So the choice of a career that is not remunerative. Now in earlier generations, I don't want to romanticize, but even John D. Rockefeller was a devout Baptist. Somewhere he knew that being rich wasn't the only question, that the question of even his own salvation was dependent on charity or public service of some kind through philanthropy. It didn't make these individuals better employers or didn't justify what the injustice of the sort of radical, um, what mine called exploitation of workers that was involved in their wealth. But uh, nonetheless, we're left with a notion that um, rich is better. And today it's not only rich, but fame. So someone like Kim Kardashian, there's a whole level of empty fame I mean, Donald Trump is a good example of this. Um, so uh, there is no, there's no achievement. There's, n there's nothing there. It's a, it's a kind of uh, conspiracy of image um, building. He's a, um, he's a master in in some kind of bizarre entertainment, which now has its consequence in politics. Um, so the American system has the misfortune of, of having to be dependent on persuading individuals to support the arts. 
the European system, or even the Canadian system, um, is, from our point of view, uh, it's, um, we're envious because there is a tax-supported base for it. Those systems are not perfect either. Um, and having worked in them, uh, they're not totally perfect because one of the difficult issues in a democratic context is what is worthwhile measured by the number of people who either deal with it and consume it or want it. So a trashy novel sells X copies, but a novel that some elite have deemed to be important and great um, doesn't have a democratic following. So the United States is radically, in this regard, loyal to the egalitarian idea that um, it's a matter of taste. So um, why should the state subsidize something that only 200 people think is great? Right? Now, in science, they don't have any difficulty with that because um, the number of people who understand quantum mechanics is limited. But people agree that it's important. Right? So when someone, you go to the hospital and you have an MRI or a CAT scan, you don't really understand what the science behind that is but you accept it as valid. But there's no criterion of validity in the arts. Uh, so in a democratic context, now in Austria it's a little easier because it's a kind of tourist national heritage. So uh, Austria can say we own music, you know, Mozart, you know, Haydn, Beethoven, so it's a, a, a tourist, so it's, it's kind of the national patrimony. It's easier to defend. Um, in the United States, even uh, an, or, an American created art form jazz is no longer totally commercially viable. It's not commercially viable. It has to be subsidized by private. Jazz at Lincoln Center requires private philanthropy not a popular art form. There are people listening to Ornette Coleman or Thelonious Monk is very limited, as limited as in the classical side. Now, it's not a bad discipline because um, we're in the midst of an extreme right and extreme left mistrust of elites. And there's a confusion about the idea of excellence or greatness or distinction because I am or you are a gifted artist doesn't make you a better person, doesn't give you more votes. Right? That is a clear principle. But the democratic societies have a difficult way of justifying the support of certain art forms um, that don't necessarily have a popular following. Uh, the European nations have a little bit easier because it's, it has a kind of national heritage issue. Um, and then, of course, in music, there is the utilitarian defense. So, El Sistema in, in Chavez. So, Abreu was a genius. He created an infrastructure of fantastic musicians, of which Gustavo Dudamel is the most famous, but um, uh, by making the learning of music an instrument of social upward mobility for the poor. And in China and in Korea, in much of Asia, what we call Western music, 
has been adopted in the way mathematics might be adopted as a, as a desirable um, personal discipline and transformation. And um, t without that um, surge of interest, the so-called classical music world would be in great trouble. And what's fascinating is that it has transformed uh, the contemporary scene of what new music is. Um, but there, the state uh, has decided that, so in America, there's a talk about the Mozart effect. There's no science behind this. So if a pregnant individual, you know, listen to Mozart, the child will be smarter. I, that can't be true. But if it, I don't mind if people believe it. You know, it's, I'm happy, since there's no evidence that it's not true, why not go along? Um, uh, I do think that, uh, especially in today's culture, learning to play an instrument, learning to write music, learning to sing is a great thing. Great thing for the development of pride and self-respect for a human being. So uh, much of the philanthropy in the United States is we do make a utilitarian argument. Um, it's similar to um, a lot of people in the United States have built churches they don't go to, but they think somebody else should go. So, and that's not a bad argument. Um, uh, and um, I once had to convince a donor when I was in Jerusalem, an American donor to Jerusalem that he said to me, he's interested in Jerusalem, but not interested in music. So I said, what are you interested in? He said, I'm interested in, in, um, in the social development of the city and um, making sure that the city doesn't tilt too far to the extreme religious. So I said, support the orchestra because you want musicians who are not religious living in the city. Is everybody in your, do I want every one of my neighbors in Manhattan to be an investment banker? No, I'd like to live next to an artist, a musician, a teacher, right? So the differentiation of social professions can be achieved by supporting artists. So he gave the money. I don't think he ever showed up at a concert. We have three more minutes left for one quick question and one quick answer. If there is a question, short, please. I'm curious about, um, well, thank you for your comments, first of all. But I'm curious about this uh, comment that you made that art is something without clear utility. And if we have art, whether it's visual art or music or whatever, that's overtly political, couldn't we say that that has a social utility? So I, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm a skeptic on the utility of political art. Um, I, I, I'm a skeptic. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I don't think the Horst Wessel lead was very effective. It's a symptom, not a cause. Um, you know, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven was played by Leonard Bernstein in the fall of the wall and played for Hitler's birthday in front of the veterans of the uh, invasion of Russia on the Eastern Front. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, propaganda art, um, if you look at it, um, is very influential. Um, I do think movies can be, um, uh, they can be, uh, there is something in it, but that's a margin. Most of poetry, um, it, does, it does mean it doesn't have political content, but I am not sure that it's really useful. Um, now the Americans spent a lot of money during the Second World making films. Film is, an, is a most complicated medium and television video in order to convince the Americans to fight the war. So the directors, they, they spent an enormous amount, they hired all these Hollywood directors uh, to make a series of films called Why We Fight. And, and they said they were effective. And there's a medium propaganda, the same thing as a propaganda book. Uh, uh, and so I'm not suggesting that some art forms, I mean, 
um, uh, especially public art forms. Uh, so the Revolution of 1830 is said to have broken out in a performance of a Muette Portici, an opera. Um, hard to connect the opera to that. Um, but even during, I, 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 I think, it, if I had to win a political campaign uh, through art, I, I would be in grave trouble. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, um, but I'm not denying that it can have an impact. I, 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 but I, I take Rousseau's critique that the empathetic response to a, an overtly political um, may not lead you to action, but the opposite may persuade you that you've done enough just by having compassion or agreement. You follow me? That uh, if I play a political song, uh, I've advanced the cause of my beliefs. I I'm not sure you do. You have. So um, I, 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 I stand by the power of art in, in its fascination precisely because it is, um, it's not a piece of social engineering. It's not a, it doesn't do anything except to the, the, the consciousness and self-consciousness of the person involved, the maker, the person who puts it out, the, if it is a performing art, and the person who's receiving is spending time with it. I find this a beautiful finale of our talk today. Thank you, Leon, for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you.